And welcome to Prism of the Past, a weekly series about historical events, people, and situations from the fascinating to the forgotten. I'm the Illuminati, and today on Prism of the Past, we're going to be talking about the secret life of a Playboy bunny. Although our primary focus today will be about life as a Playboy bunny and what that meant, we're also going to be talking about Hugh Hefner, Playboy's founder and the role he played at the mansion itself. Anyway, before we get into the dark secrets of the Playboy Mansion, I want to put two big disclaimers here right at the start of this episode. First and foremost, sex work is real work, whether that's posing nude in a Playboy magazine, acting in pornography, taking on clients, dancing, sex work is work. I do not want anyone shaming any of the women that I'll be mentioning or talking about today as if they were somehow asking to be abused or deserved any hardship that came their way. That's not the purpose of today's episode. It's simply to reveal that this mansion wasn't the glitz and glamor that many have believed it to be. The second disclaimer is more of a content warning. If you're sensitive to hearing about drugs, sexual abuse, or things of that nature, this may not be the episode for you. I more than understand if that's the case, and hopefully I'll just see you in the next one. With all of that being said, let's dive right into it and talk about how the Playboy Mansion was founded and how this mansion came to rise to notoriety. Hugh Hefner was born in 1926 in Chicago, Illinois to a strict Methodist household. It's reported that while Hefner had a high IQ, his academic performance was generally modest. He showed an interest in journalism early on, becoming president of the student council and founding a school newspaper. He created a comic book entitled School Days as well. After serving for two years as a non-combatant in the army during the end of World War II, Hefner studied at Chicago Art Institute before seemingly changing his mind and majoring in psychology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign instead. Hefner landed a copywriting job at Esquire Magazine, but left when he was denied a raise. According to one source, out on his own, Hefner was determined to start his own publication. He raised $8,000 from 45 investors, including $2,000 from his mother and brother, Keith, combined to launch the Playboy magazine. Hefner had planned to title the magazine Stag Party, but was forced to change the name to avoid a trademark infringement with the existing Stag magazine. A colleague suggested the name Playboy after a defunct automobile company. Hefner liked the name as he thought it reflected high living and sophistication. Hefner produced the first edition of Playboy out of his Southside home. It hit newsstands in December, 1953, but did not carry a date because Hefner was unsure as to whether or not a second issue would be produced. To help ensure its success, Hefner had purchased a color photograph of actress Marilyn Monroe in the nude, which had been taken some years earlier and placed it in the centerfold of the magazine. The first issue quickly sold more than 50,000 copies and became an instant sensation. After 30 years of war and economic depression, the magazine was a welcome antidote to the sexual repression of the era. The rabbit, an animal that's known for reproducing, was chosen for being frisky yet playful. Playboy even broadened its circulation with some thoughtful articles so that it wouldn't be simply dismissed as, well, porn. Esquire, his former employer, had rejected a science fiction short story called The Crooked Man, which depicted a world in which heterosexuals were a minority and homosexuals were a majority. Hefner not only published the piece in a 1955 edition of Playboy, but stated that if it was wrong to persecute heterosexuals in a homosexual society, then the reverse was wrong too. He was advocating for gay rights long before same-sex marriage became legal, and I'll give him credit for that, absolutely. I've got a ton of issues with Hefner, as we'll see, but I won't pretend he never did any good either. To this day, many say that on the outside, he was a hedonistic, extravagant, flamboyant activist and philanthropist who had his way with some of the most beautiful women in the country. The comment section on one docuseries chronicling his life has a few men saying that he used to be an idol to them growing up and how he was living a fantasy life for many. As one New York Times article puts it, 
To his supporters, he is the great sexual liberator who helped free Americans from puritanism and neurosis. To his detractors, including many feminists and social conservatives, he helped set in motion a revolution in sexual attitudes that have objectified and victimized countless women and promoted an immoral, whatever feels good approach to life. Other sources say that while Hefner may have had progressive ideals and sparked a sexual revolution, it was ultimately self-serving. As one article states, To Hefner, sexual liberation meant the acceptance and visibility of male desire, coupled with the ability of women to publicly fulfill those desires and appear as outwardly sexual beings. But an opening of sexual mores on straight men's terms does not mean an automatic upgrade for all women. This explains why he reacted so poorly to radical feminist critiques of Playboy's nude centerfolds, typically featuring big breasts and seductive poses. What I'm interested in is the highly irrational, emotional cookie trend that feminism has taken in the last couple of years, he wrote in an internal 1970 memo. These chicks are our natural enemy and there is nothing we can say in the pages of Playboy that will convince them that we are not. It is time to do battle with them and I think we can do it. Ultimately, Hefner never set out to create a true sexual revolution. He set out to create a sexual revolution that would benefit him. He used his own desires and frustrations as a lens through which to build out entertainment for other men like him and to push the envelope of what was considered socially acceptable. Some of those desires and frustrations happened to help open up space for people who weren't straight, white, rich men to more openly express their sexuality. Others did not. And look, Hefner absolutely had success. There were some bumps along the way where he stood trial for selling obscene literature, though the charge was eventually dropped. He founded the Playboy Foundation to fight censorship and promote research on human sexuality. I don't know what was on his mind and say for sure what his intent may have been. Whether you believe Hugh Hefner was on the front lines of a sexual revolution, or you think he didn't fundamentally challenge anything, but instead magnified an existing sexual imbalance, that is ultimately your opinion. Did challenge puritanical ideals, yes, but a sexual revolution? Well, let's take a look at that. Before we talk about the mansion, however, since I'm trying to maintain some sort of timeline here, we have to talk about some of the clubs that Hafner ran known as the Playboy Clubs. Though the clubs are now defunct, they were massive, especially in the 60s and 70s. One political activist that wanted to see what these Playboy Clubs were really about went undercover to do exactly that, Gloria Steinem. Gloria Steinem's name, as biography states, is synonymous with feminism. She created the National Women's Political Caucus, the Free to Be Foundation, Women's Media Center, and Women's Action Alliance. One of her famous quotes is, the truth will set you free, but first it will piss you off, is also the title of her 2019 book. Her undercover story ran in Show Magazine's 1963 May and June issues as a story called A Bunny's Tale. As the article states, Responding to an ad looking for girls who were pretty and personable between 21 and 24, she headed to the gaudy venue during an open application session with the required swimsuit or leotard in hand. Taking on the name of Marie Catherine Oakes, Steinem created a new identity, shedding years off her actual age and creating a resume filled with waitressing in London and working as a dancer hostess in Paris. She shares my apartment, my phone, and my measurements, Steinem wrote in the story, though younger than I by four years. Marie celebrates the same birthday and went to the same high school and college, but she wasn't a slave to academics, not Marie. The objectification started the moment she walked into the building when a guard beckoned her with, here, bunny, 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 and the job interviewer insisting more than once that she take off her coat. Now, before I go any further, I do want to clarify something because I'm sure there's a few of you wondering like about that remark, like, hey, times were different back then, so I can't really judge by today's standard. But first of all, does that make it okay? Objectively, because celebrities, job interviewers, wealthy people, and just everyday people in general weren't called out for objectifying sexist behaviors in the 60s, does that mean that they were okay? Because I would argue that just because times were different doesn't mean that we can't state now in present time that we should not have been okay with that type of behavior. Secondly, let me remind everyone that this came from Hugh Hefner's business, a man who has been called a pioneer for women's sexual liberation. So I'm just curious how that's liberating. Like, what am I missing here? 
Steinem was told that her fake age of 24, she was actually 28, was awfully old, and she was given a satin blue bunny costume that was so tight the zipper caught her skin. The entire construction pushed all her flesh up to her chest and wardrobe even then stuffed the top of her costume for extra cleavage. Fully strapped into her bunny gear, Steinem was able to infiltrate the inner world in a way no one had ever seen. She quickly learned that behind the joyful appearance, bunnies must always appear gay and cheerful, was a system of fear with constant threats of being docked demerits and being exposed by secret shoppers of sorts. A bunny's pay was also nowhere near the promised two to $300 a week, which would be about $1,700 to $2,600 today. The financial cost of being a bunny was shocking from the start. They were responsible for buying their own heels, which had to be at least three inches, had to pay $2.50 per day, about $21 today adjusted for inflation for their costumes upkeep and $5 a pair for nylons that had to be disposed of as soon as they had a run in them. The only reason they were paid $50 a week, about $430 now, was because of New York City's minimum wage laws at the time and much of their tips were taken away. The club takes 50% of the first $30 worth of those that are charged 25% of amounts up to $60 and 5% after that for drink orders. We may keep all cash tips that are given to us in case, but if we indicate any preference for cash tips, we will be fired, she wrote in her article for show. And certain roles like working hat check didn't get tips at all. This kind of reminds me of MLMs in the way, how they say they're empowering women when it kind of feels like they're just taking advantage of women more than anything. Don't promise someone a pay that you have no intention to deliver on. It's really as simple as that. Steinem said she felt like an idiot having to do the bunny dance, a way of placing drinks on the table that they would pose and show off their bodies. She had to spend many hours in that uniform with heels, gauze wrapped around her feet with men gawking at her. Hey, if someone signs up for the gig and they love it, that's cool, you do you. But again, I'm failing to see what kind of sexual revolution this actually was. Not to mention why on earth would they require a gyno exam by a male doctor of the club's choice? Now, this was adapted into a TV movie in 1985 starring Kirstie Alley as the title role. The original Manhattan Playboy Club shuttered in 1986 and the potential revival was slammed by critics because, you know, opening a Playboy Club in the Me Too movement era seems pretty tone deaf and it felt like a step backwards for many. Inevitably, the new clubs closed and the Playboy Clubs of yesteryear have always sort of remained in this questionable murky area. According to Vanity Fair, The club's central attractions were the famous Playboy bunnies, the glorified waitresses who brave skimpy, pinching, corset-like costumes to serve their titillated patrons of Playboy clubs throughout the world and who, in their idolized form, rank among the most iconic of 20th century American sex objects, eclipsed only by Marilyn Monroe. En masse, they helped shape the fantasies of several generations of adolescent and post-adolescent men when they weren't clearing tables or trying to remember the proper garnish for a Cuba Libre. In this article, some women have called it liberating. Some previous bunnies said these girls loved having a walk on the wild side in a safe environment. Others say it was hard work, but they loved it. And one even states that bunnies were in power because they could say, you're not allowed to touch the bunny or bunnies are not allowed to date the customer. These previous bunnies would know better than me what the environment was like, and I've got no right to argue with their testimony. If they enjoyed this work, that's absolutely fine, and I'm glad that it was safe for them. I personally wouldn't say that this is really anything revolutionary, just simply amplifying expectations put upon women at that time, but hey, that's my opinion. However, even though there's a lot of debate and controversy around this topic thus far, let's get into some of the less debated topics and the more objectionably bad and dangerous behavior. And we'll start with what actually happened at the Playboy Mansion. The 29 room Gothic Tudor was purchased for just over a million dollars in the 70s. And shortly after it was purchased, it became a symbol of hedonistic 90s. One source writes, his lavish parties brought A-listers, C-listers, zoo animals, and others to hang out with playmates and the wannabe pinups the magazine attracted. Actor comedian Bill Cosby was also a frequent guest at the mansion and in many allegations of rape and sexual assault levied against Cosby in recent years, one filed by a Riverside County woman alleged that he sexually assaulted her when she was 15 years old and attending a party at the Playboy Mansion. 
and we'll mention Cosby more in a little bit. While the outside was glitzy and glamorous, the women in there were trapped, as Time Magazine puts it. They had to stick to tight curfews, they were pressured to engage in sex acts, and plied with drugs. One former bunny, Holly Madison, has spoken out about her experience in a memoir titled Down the Rabbit Hole. Holly became famous on the reality show, The Girls Next Door, which depicted life in the Playboy Mansion. She was one of Hefner's live-in girlfriends at the time, though she eventually left him and naturally the series. She lived there for seven years and says that while there were many red flags along the way, she hadn't necessarily wanted to see them. Kendra and Madison have both written and spoken about their experiences since then, with Kendra saying that, "'We were all in a limo on the way to a book signing with Hef when he pulled me aside. "'Is everything okay?' he asked. "'I feel fat, Hef,' I told him. "'Everyone is so pretty. "'It's making me really insecure.'" "'Well, you look a little bigger,' he said honestly. "'Maybe you can go to the gym.'" When we got home, I went to my room and cried myself to sleep. I was disappointed in myself. I had this whole mansion and a great life to enjoy and all I was doing was lying around and eating. I felt so lazy and miserable. This was supposed to be paradise, but for me, it wasn't. Another bunny, Isabella St. James, said that they got allowances from Hefner every Friday and they had a ritual of going to Hefner's room, picking the dog poo off the carpet because the other girls had pet dogs in the mansion and then they could ask for their allowance. Overall though, Holly Madison has sort of been regarded as one of Hefner's main girlfriends, and she actually believes a different girlfriend's book, Kendra, is too light or soft-shoeing around the problems at the Playboy Mansion, so I was most curious as to what she had to say. One source states, Madison writes that very early in their relationship, Hefner offers Madison a quaalude. These were popular recreational drugs from the 60s to 80s, but they've since been made illegal. He explains that like his good friend, Bill Cosby, he personally disapproves of drug use. But since in his charming turn of phrase in the 1970s, these notorious pills were known as thigh openers, he has had no problem doling them out like Tic Tacs. Madison is self-aware enough to realize that when a potential beau essentially offers, hey, how about a nice date rate drug? It'll relax you and make it easier for me to sexually violate you. As an opening gambit, it's best to stay the hell away but she could not resist the siren song of life as a sexy, glamorous playmate. Madison had imagined life at the mansion would resemble a giant slumber party full of sister solidarity, friendships, and good times. Instead, it was a viper's pit of manipulation, backstabbing, deceit with Hef's girlfriends competing for his favor. Even on the first episode of The Girls Next Door, Holly admits that her life revolves around Hef and she doesn't know if she believes Hefner when he says their relationship is the most meaningful he's ever had. I did actually watch this full episode since it was called Meet the Girls and I was curious to see what they had to say about Hefner and the nature of their relationships. And honestly, it just strikes me as really, really odd. For instance, apparently Hugh Hefner met one of his girlfriends, Kendra, because he saw her photo on his printer while she was in a different part of the mansion there for a body painting event. He apparently saw her photo and demanded to know who that was. Then lo and behold, in almost no time at all, Kendra was living in the mansion. Obviously Kendra did consent to living there. It's not as if he locked the doors and forced her to stay, but the nature of that relationship is a bit odd to me. If you think about it, he just meets this young woman and without really any time to know her, she's suddenly just living there as one of his girlfriends. The other girls have similar stories too, so it's hard for me to believe that Hefner truly cared as to who they were as people and perhaps maybe saw them more as possessions. And yes, on the television show, they say that they're excited to be there. They're really like Hefner and life in the mansion, but even Madison says that Hefner collected women. One source addresses not only the problems at the Playboy Mansion, but the issues they have with Madison's book as well. And it reads, in a characteristic passage, Madison writes, quote, as Tina led me into the bedroom, I stumbled over and weaved through massive piles of junk covering the floor. It appeared that Hef liked to collect more than just women. Ceiling high piles of videotapes, stuffed animals, art, and gifts littered the room. It was like an episode of Hoarders, but perhaps in his case, it would be more appropriately titled Hoarders, end quote. This passage is essentially the book in microcosm. Everything is there, the casual and not so casual slut shaming, the depiction of the Playboy Mansion as a shimmering palace from the outside, but a hell hole on the inside, the air of smug superiority, as well as the self-satisfied, none too clever wordplay. Transitioning from one of Hefner's seven girlfriends to one of the three stars of the hit reality show, Girls Next Door, Madison was enticed by the proverbial golden handcuffs. 
but there were more than gold spray painted handcuffs full of rust since her glamorous life was oddly short on money, even if it was long on luxury and indulgences. We learn that Hefner doesn't even own the Playboy Mansion, Playboy does, and Hefner merely rents it. This source in particular suggests that Holly Madison was pointing the finger at the women Hefner surrounded with, calling them slutty, cheap, greedy, tacky, and sluts, when in actuality, Hefner was the one inciting drama, manipulating them, being sexist, condescending, and emotionally abusive. I think that's something that's important to remember here. Hefner was essentially pinning these women against one another, so attacking these women does absolutely nothing. I can't condone this aspect of Holly Madison's actions, even if I do applaud her for speaking out. And that's why I think the attention here needs to stay on Hefner and his action, not so much the competition that he instigated. According to another source, Hefner's Playboy Mansion functioned a lot like an internment camp. Hefner exercised totalitarian control over his girlfriends. They had a 9 p.m. curfew, and if they violated it, Hefner would burst into tears and tell them they should move out. He instituted a strict set of bizarre rules, including forcing each girl to wear matching pajamas. If you do something wrong, you'll get an email. There's a strict code of conduct. He would constantly create drama and infighting among his girlfriends by randomly changing his long held positions or household policies to favor one over the rest of them. He would selectively belittle girls. You look old, hard, and cheap, talk down to them, and frequently made them cry. He refused to use condoms or be tested for STDs and would require depressing group sex at regularly scheduled times. Each week, the girls would have a scheduled time to go to Hefner to receive their allowance and he would threaten to withhold their payment if they dissatisfied him or broken a rule. As Madison writes, quote, "'We all hated this process. Hef would always use the occasion to bring up anything he wasn't happy about in the relationship. Most of the complaints were about the lack of harmony among the girlfriends or your lack of sexual participation in the parties he held in his bedroom. If we'd been out of town for any reason and missed one of the official going out nights when Hefner liked to parade his girls at nightclubs, he wouldn't want to give us the allowance. He used it as a weapon, end quote. Madison became severely depressed over her years in the mansion after she realized the security gates were there to keep her locked in and began thinking suicide might be her only way out. Two other girls who spent time in the mansion were clear. It was like being in prison. Hefner then was a domestic abuser. That's the name we have for this type of person. What type of person imposes a curfew on their partner and locks them inside a mansion, dictating their clothes, regulating their personal interactions and chastising them for breaking his rules? This is tyrannical and horrifying. However, despite what may have been going on behind closed doors, the Playboy Mansion was still an icon on the outside. Slowly though, it did begin to, well, lose its luster as one source puts it. While this source attributes this to Hefner's declining health and the AIDS epidemic, which as the LA Times puts it, put the brakes on the sexual revolution, another massive event contributed to the decline of the Playboy Mansion, the death of Dorothy Stratton. Dorothy Stratton was a Playboy Playmate model and actress. She was the Playboy Playmate of the month of August, 1979 and Playmate of the year in 1980. Stratton was described as breathtakingly beautiful and after having been discovered by Paul Snyder, a pimp in Vancouver, Canada with dreams of Hollywood fame, she was slowly working her way to stardom. However, according to ABC News, several people in Stratton's orbit said they saw Snyder as a predator who was looking for his golden ticket. Mariel Hemingway, who played Stratton in the Bob Fosse film about Stratton's life, Star 80, said that Snyder took advantage of Stratton's insecurities. Hemingway said Snyder would compliment her on her things, which made her feel most vulnerable. He would then shower her with expensive gifts, nice dinners, and even a gown to wear when he took her to her senior prom. She was still a teen then, he was 26. You think of him and you think of a wolf, and you think of him stalking his prey, said Hemingway. In Star 80, Paul Snyder comes and takes Dorothy to her high school prom, and it really does feel uncomfortable. Although some said Stratton wasn't ready for fame as she was too shy, young, and ill-prepared, when Dorothy sent her photos into Playboy, they arranged for a shoot and fairly quickly named her Miss August 1979. Yet while Stratton's career was taken off, Snyder was left behind in the dust. It was his own fault, honestly. He was caught with another girl when Stratton and Snyder were exclusive, having been married in 1978. People did oppose the marriage and eventually Stratton herself wanted out. She mentioned giving Snyder a settlement, but he seemed to realize that he had nothing, no ownership, no more control and snapped. 
Snyder brought a gun seemingly with the mindset that if he couldn't have her, no one could. ABC News reported that on August 14th, 1980, Stratton went over to the house that she once shared with Snyder, Kushner, and Lorman to try and negotiate a settlement with her husband as part of their divorce. Those close to her are said to have expressed their concern with her going to see him alone. Hef and Peter kind of forbid her from going to see him, Jenna Keough, playmate of 1980 November said. They forbid it, she had to sneak. She had to lie. She just misjudged that guy so badly. She just had that little flaw that was her flaw, not being able to see the evil in people. Tragically, Snyder raped and then shot Stratton, then shot himself in a murder-suicide. Stratton was only 20 years old at the time. Years later, Hefner was accused of making unwanted advances on Stratton at the mansion in 1978, but Hefner denied those claims. And instead, many articles paint the event as a dark one that followed Hefner for years to come. However, many saw this in a different light, one being the filmmaker, Peter Bogdanovich, who met Stratton at a Playboy Mansion party and fell in love with her. Peter states that Stratton couldn't handle the slick professional machinery of the Playboy sex factory, nor the continual efforts of its founder to try and bring her into his personal fold. It was also Bogdanovich that accused Hefner of forcing himself on Stratton. According to one source, Hefner at a news conference accused Bogdanovich of causing the stress which led to his stroke. He did not stop there. He also threw out his own accusation, saying that Bogdanovich seduced Stratton's little sister, Louise, who was 12 when her famous sister died, as a pathological replacement for the woman he could no longer have. Louise Stratton filed a slander lawsuit against Hefner that was later dropped. In 1989, at the age of 20, she and Bogdanovich were married. They divorced 12 years later. Obviously, I've got no idea if Dorothy would still be alive today if it weren't for her part in Playboy. Snyder is ultimately to blame here for her death. Dorothy was a beautiful woman that died far too young. Understandably, this is where the Playboy Mansion began its initial decline. Many wouldn't be so inclined to come around after such an event. However, this is also where far, far more allegations of abuse began to surface in the wake of her passing. Now, continuing on into the more darker portion of today's episode, and this is where it's gonna get worse. If you thought the initial stuff we've already talked about is bad, wait until we come to this. But this is what was portrayed to the media and the everyday lives of the bunnies and employees beneath Hefner. There are still darker, more questionable actions beneath the surface. Holly Madison has stated in an interview that when she was in a dark suicidal place of her life, Hefner simply told her to speak to his secretary. One source from 1985 reads, Playboy magazine publisher Hugh Hefner and his staff gave drugs to playmates and pushed them into participating in bisexual acts and orgies to satisfy Hefner's interests, a former playmate testified Thursday. Mickey Garcia, who appeared in Playboy as Miss January 1973, also told the US Commission on Pornography that Hefner's security force helped cover up the discovery of an international call girl ring in which more than one playmate was involved. Playboy denied the allegations. I want the public to recognize that Playboy magazine is not the coffee table literature that Hugh Hefner says it is, but rather a pornographic magazine, she said. Garcia, 40, said she was the director of Playmate Promotions from 1976 to 1982 and was told by models about rapes, mental and physical abuse, attempted murder, drug addiction, attempted suicide, and prostitution. Although models complained they were harassed by advertisers, Playboy allowed the abuse to continue because it was good for business, Garcia said, saying Playboy's attitude is, you are now a Playmate, don't be so stuffy. It's all right to do this, it's LA chic. She falls prey to this. She testifies that orgies and bisexual acts were encouraged, if not coerced, and a former bunny, Brenda McElthop, exposed similar actions at a convention in 1987. She said that she turned to alcohol and tranquilizers to avoid facing the perversions at the mansion and recounted tales of date rape, physical abuse, and group sex. At the Hefner mansion, Brenda attended group sex parties where pornographic movies were shown and homosexual activity was encouraged. She said that Linda Loveless, a porn star, was urged by her husband to have sex publicly with a German shepherd for Hefner's viewing purposes. She declined. The turning point in Brenda's life came when she was sodomized during an orgy in Hugh Hefner's mansion. She thought, is this supposed to be love? Is this what the Playboy philosophy is all about? Were men just using me to satisfy their lust without commitment or love? And was I just using my body to get what I wanted? 
She then realized that men had no respect for her. And just as Marilyn Monroe had once said about herself, she too felt like a piece of meat to be passed around. And yes, you did hear that right. It was an advocating act to do stuff with a German shepherd as in a dog. Brenda went completely the opposite direction after all of this, advocating against porn in general. Even though I don't agree with Brenda with the ideal that all porn is horrible, I completely understand why she felt that way. Even after being pressured, being forced into that lifestyle and around those types of people, I can't blame her in the slightest for wanting to be as far away from it as possible and shout from the rooftops all about it. I don't know if it was the death of Dorothy Stratton that truly encouraged others to speak out or not, but I do think it's so incredibly important that they have. He was even named in one of the lawsuits against Bill Cosby a few years back, being shown to be an enabler in the situation. One 2016 article reads that model Chloe Goines believes, Hefner is also at fault because he hosted young and impressionable women at his home, provided them with alcohol and introduced them to Cosby. The 90 year old playboy should have known that defendant Cosby over the years had a propensity for intoxicating and drugging young women and taking advantage of them sexually and against their will or while they were unconscious, Goins says in her complaint. She asserts claims of sexual battery and gender violence against Cosby and negligent infliction of emotional distress and conspiracy to commit sexual battery against both Cosby and Hefner. Hefner seems like he could dish out lawsuits, but not take them, considering how much this upset him and how he threatened to sue a journalist for calling him a pimp in the past. Hugh Hefner wasn't just some womanizer. That's minimizing the abuse that these women went through dealing with him. I don't really care how many wives he's had or that the mansion is actually pretty gross, stained, smells like dog shit, and the grotto is contaminated beyond belief. I don't care how Hefner's daughter Christy is taking over and how his son says you can always catch someone having sex at the mansion. None of these things really matter in the wake of this abuse. It's just all shallow puff pieces. But unfortunately with Hugh Hefner, that seems to be all too common. When Hugh Hefner died, many, many articles praised the man. And look, I do feel a bit weird at times speaking ill of the dead because they can't defend themselves. But by the same token, I'm going to call out bullshit when I see it. The BBC had this to say after Hugh Hefner died. A political activist and philanthropist, he produced not just a magazine, but a whole lifestyle. And in Playboy's famous bow tie wearing rabbit, he launched one of the most recognized brands of the 20th century. He was a keen supporter of conservation organizations and perhaps appropriately, he had a species of rabbit named in his honor. In his later years, Hugh Hefner was much ridiculed as the elderly man who still surrounded himself with beautiful young women. But in Playboy, he created a lifestyle which was in tune with the aspirations of a large section of post-war American society. The feminist Camille Paglia called him one of the principal architects of the social revolution. I am a kid in a candy store, Hefner famously said. I dreamed impossible dreams and the dreams turned out beyond anything I could possibly imagine. I am the luckiest cat on the planet. BBC wrote an entire article on him and not once did they mention any of the abuse. The same could be said of the Washington Post. The New York Times did mention Holly Madison's book very briefly for about four or five sentences, while the rest is widely positive. I feel like they spent more time talking about how the magazine is no longer illicit and how he's going to be buried next to Marilyn Monroe than they do any of the real abuse, but okay, I guess. The thing is, I'm not saying these obituaries should be celebrating his death, but it's disheartening to see him praised over and over and over in articles and tweets, whereas the stories of him are actually truly hurting people and so rarely told. It genuinely took quite a bit of digging to find what former bunnies had to say. And even when I did, I had to find multiple sources to corroborate the information because I don't simply wanna use People Magazine or Cosmo as sources. I wanted to find something more reputable than that. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that I had to work to build some sort of false narrative. That's not what I'm trying to do here. Simply that the abuse was far less reported on than I thought it would be. Three days after the New York Times released their obituary for him, for example, they also released an opinion piece called Speaking Ill of Hugh Hefner, where writer Ross Douthat writes, Hugh Hefner, gone to his reward at the age of 91, was a pornographer and chauvinist who got rich on masturbation, consumerism, and the exploitation of women, aged into a leering grotesque in a captain's hat and died a pack rat in a decaying manse where porn blared during his pathetic orgies. Hef was the grinning pimp of the sexual revolution with quaaludes for the ladies and Viagra for himself. 
a father of smut addictions and eating disorders, abortions and divorce and syphilis, a pretentious huckster who published Updike stories no one would read while doing flesh procurement for celebrities, a revolutionary whose revolution chiefly benefited men much like himself. Needless to say, the obituaries for Hefner, even if they acknowledge the seeminess, have been full of encomia for his great deeds. Hef, the vanquisher of Puritanism, Hef, the political progressive, Hef, the great businessman, and all the rest. There are even conservative appreciations, arguing that for all his faults, Hef was an entrepreneur who appreciated the finer things in life and celebrated la difference. A lot of garbage. Like New York Times, I'm looking at you. Isn't that hypocritical as fuck for you to release this opinion piece saying the obituaries are too kind to him when three days earlier, your own obituary stated, Mr. Hefner began excoriating American Puritanism at a time when doctors refused contraceptives to single women and the Hollywood production code dictated separate beds for married couples. The Playboy philosophy advocated freedom of speech in all its aspects for which Mr. Hefner won civil liberties awards. He supported progressive social causes and lost some sponsors by inviting black guests to his televised parties at a time when much of the nation still had Jim Crow laws. Friends described him as both charming and shy, even unassuming and intensely loyal. Hef was always big for the girls who got depressed or got in a jam of some sort. The artist Leroy Neiman, one of the magazine's main illustrators for more than 50 years, said in an interview in 1999. He's a friend, he's a good person. I couldn't cite anything he ever did that was malicious to anybody. Pick Elaine, my dude. Are you going to quote his friend saying he was such a good guy? Or are you gonna publish an article that calls him out for being a manipulative asshole? It's also kind of shady that they'll publish the obituary as is, whereas on the article calling him out, they make sure to smack opinion at the top as if it's less valid. Yes, that particular article was an opinion piece, but maybe if they did their job, interviewed former bunnies and backed up those opinions with facts, then people wouldn't be debating what he did for women's rights if he really did anything at all. Again, New York Times was not the only paper to do this. And for the most part, I don't really trust them as a news source. Just kind of thought it was here as a clear example for many as to the story of Hugh Hefner and why the story may not be told in full. However, as of writing this, there's supposedly a documentary in the works that intends to show Hefner and Playboy's darker side that is more honest. And I'm pretty hopeful for that. I hope the documentary digs up even more than I initially could, but for that, we'll just have to wait and see. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of Prism of the Past. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure to like, follow, and subscribe wherever you're hearing this so you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes. And if you wanna connect with me outside of these episodes, make sure you go to the description box and click on my Linktree link, which will have links to all of my social media, projects I'm working on, and things of that nature. So again, thank you all so much for making it to another episode. I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.